After all that sad stories in the previous video on copy paste city, today we'll talk about the strategies that brings diversity to our cities. Hi everyone and welcome to this channel where we talk about urban development process and what makes our cities look and function in certain way. This is the third video on the housing topic and in the previous one we spoke about the huge homogeneous housing developments. If you haven't seen that one, I will add the link in the description below. And by the way, last time I forgot to mention one more reason, which I will add in the end of this video, like a bonus. And today, as I promised you, we will speak about the good and positive examples of big housing development. To make our journey more consistent, uh, we will follow the same checkpoints as in the previous video, so you will have kind of a framework to compare these positive examples and the failures. So, we will start again with the question, who owns the land? And you already know that the private and public owners have different drivers, which influence the program composition. However, in some countries they have tools that let the uh, municipality to influence the decisions of the owners. For example, in Netherlands, if developer wants to buy a land, he needs to participate in auction and, of course, set some price bet. But he should support it with the uh, project of vision of what he wants to do with this plot. So municipality actually has a voice on what kind of projects they want to have in the area, even though they don't own this land. <laughs> That's crazy, no? So as a result, not always the highest bet win. The second option you can find in the toolbox of land value capture. In Latin and Northern America, they separated the right to the plot and the right to build something on it. And you know that with the great power, aka rights, comes great responsibilities. Well, you can find kind of the traces of this approach in the famous Osterwald project of MBRDV. But in other cases, local authorities went even further and created kind of a boundaries and within them the owners could exchange or even trade these development rights and responsibilities, which on one hand can secure the social needs and diversity in the area, and on another hand, it helps the owners to be more flexible and adapt to the market and their own needs. This is actually an interesting topic and I think I will add more videos on it, but meanwhile you can check papers of Jacob Harvey. Another question is who makes the decision? I've just told you two options on how the local authorities can be part of the decision-making process in the very early stages of the project, but you can also invite them to the whole process. Well, usually the only stakeholders who are part of the design process are the developers and architects or designers, and they show only the final design to the local authorities to get the permissions, which sometimes involve bribing. Not good. Mm -mm. But I've been in part of the project where we, if I'm not mistaken, every two weeks had the project team meetings. And the core of this project team consisted of representatives from developers, designers, municipality together with local experts and on each of these meetings they would discuss the details of the project and how it goes and yes sometimes well quite often we had to make changes because of these meetings but the positive uh, aspects of that when you have a municipality on board from the very beginning of the process there is no problem with getting any permissions and in case of a project team 
uh, it's more comfortable for developers and municipality to collaborate because you know they're kind of from the same league these serious guys in suits well you know what i mean while in case of society it's getting more complicated but not hopeless. There are successful examples when the future residents were part of the whole process. For example, the project Space S in Eindhoven. And actually, after the previous video, my classmate Hala reached me out and said that Group 8, the place where she works, they test these approaches. Well, yes, the process is not always smooth and everything needs some practice, but it's still quite a promising approach. But don't let every project that claims participation process charm you. I have personally was part of some participation sessions where we invited people, presented them the project, showed them models, some panels and asked them to leave their comments and ideas on the boards. Well, after everything was finished, Thank you for the participation. We highly appreciate your input. See you next time. Would you call this a participation? I bet no. Actually, participation is one of the main points of my interest, so you will hear about it more in the coming videos. Participation is a tool for so-called people-led housing, which international organizations use for their projects in Asia and Latin America. In academic world, you will find it as a collaborative housing, and the countries which just rocketed it, um, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, and there you can find them not only as the uh, solutions for the low-income groups, but also for the middle class. Once again, it's a huge and interesting topic by itself and I will definitely make some more videos on it. The next checkpoint is to get diverse design teams for the big plot. Look at the old cities. We all love to travel and enjoy their diversity. Tourists wander around and stare because there are so many details, colors, decisions, shapes, materials to check and your eye never tired there are so many layers to unfold you can spend hours and hours on the terrace and just staring and your eye will curiously wandering around have you ever experienced that well he'd like it so <laughs> i remember the first time i went travel with my parents i think i was in the second grade of my architecture school and i was trying to catch every single detail and taking photos like thousands of them and in the last day in vienna my mom said like oh look at this nice window my answer was like i'm sick of this architecture already <laughs> i don't know why i'm sharing this but fine <laughs> going back to diverse cities I'm sure you know that uh, not a single genius or even team would be able to make something like this. The thing is that the old cities, they consisted of the tiny plots with diverse owners who would hire various architects to do the designs. And that's why our old city is such a patchwork. Look at the famous super blocks in Barcelona. The area has quite a rigid grid, but these cells, they infill of a patchwork of various buildings. But why do they fit to each other? Well, there are some simple rules like uh, red lines, it's a line way of us should be the heights limits um, and also back then the fashion and the styles didn't change so often as nowadays and there was not such a huge supply of materials and techniques and that's why the uh, part of the series of streets which were developed in the more or less the same period they quite harmonized and maybe some buildings which were added in other periods they just look like a cherry on the top and which makes it more kind of interesting and memorizable nowadays some countries still use this approach 
When OMA did Feyenoord see it's a huge master plan in Rotterdam, the local municipality uh, allowed them to develop further only a few buildings because they said we don't need an OMA city here. And it's not like they don't trust the talent or capability. The same story happened with the News Out in Antwerpen, the Funen Park in Amsterdam, the Mullen Pier in Rotterdam. One of my friends said that um, this approach can make our cities look like Shanghai, in the bad sense of it. Well, I've never been in Shanghai, so I can't judge if it's good or not. But I know that some countries use build quality plans, uh, which is kind of a guideline that goes after the master plan stage. It's a book where you find the rules about preferred materials, details, uh, shapes, approaches, uh, and what architects should avoid in this area. It's a bit tricky moment because sometimes it's just one person who decide that this balcony is good and this one is simply not good without much explanation why. And then it's almost a local law for the architects to obey and sometimes it doesn't matter how innovative your solution is, if it doesn't fit to this book, the beauty commission wouldn't allow it. I remember discussing it with my friend from another office and they were struggling with such an unjustified rule for their size and shape of balconies. Yes, build quality plan can help to harmonize the various developments, but at the same time, it can prevent the innovations and creativity. And finally, the tool that Alejandro Ravenna, the winner of the Pritzker's Architecture Prize in 2016, um, used to for the uh, social housing. What they did is just simply designing the half of the house with the room for extension and they then copy paste the uh, solutions but the fact that they had this half of the house and another half was the room for the uh, future owners to expand in the way they want in this way, they gave a possibility for the future residents to expand and adjust their homes. Of course, it's not as nitty gritty as architects would love to see when they control every single detail. Yeah, we've discussed this uh, control obsess in the first video. But it made it possible for these people to stay in a good location and have an opportunity for their bigger houses which makes it more human, don't you think so? It looks like I promised you already quite a lot of topics to cover in the future videos, but um, if you have some preferred ones, please let me know in the comments. And here's the bonus. One of the reasons I forgot to mention about the reasons that limit the diversity of our housing choice is the local regulations and building norms which sometimes could be quite weird or out of date. Every country has a regulation regarding sizes of our homes and spaces within it. And if you dig into the comparison or even justification, sometimes it's getting quite funny. My friend Oksana did a research and exhibition on this topic and she compared living rooms regulations in Sweden, Netherlands and Belgium and surprisingly they are quite different. If you want to check it, I will add the link in the description. <laughs> Looks like my video is getting longer and longer, so thank you for staying with me so long and sharing your comments and DMs I was so overwhelmed to see that many of you have similar thoughts. Thank you and that's it for now. Ciao!